you're joining us on Facebook, welcome. It's good to see you here today. And I say see in the realm of the spirit. Uh, this is one of those uh, winter days in New England when we're not gathering in the church building, but uh, we still have the ability to have the word of God go forth. Isn't that awesome? And for some of you on this Shabbat, uh, it was a change. You didn't have to get all dressed up and everything. I can imagine some of you sitting there with your cup of tea. Maybe you still got your breakfast. Uh, you know, you're dressed casually, but you're able to tune into the Word of God. So I'm glad that you've uh, chosen to spend this time with us. Uh, we're going to talk today about a dimension called faith. We're in a series where we're talking about Project 2019, and that project is you. And speaking of going on a journey, the journey from here to there. Here is wherever you are. God meets you right where you are. Your journey starts different than the next person's. And for some of us who've been on a journey uh, for ma many years, the journey of this year started in a different place, but it is here. This is, this is where we are. Uh, we're not pretending this is what we have going in our life, but we want to get there. If you ever lose a concept of there's a there that you want to get to, uh, then you've given up on life. There's always more to grow into. There's more to learn. There's more to, to exercise and more to discover in our, our life of faith uh, with Yeshua. So wherever here is for you, uh, we're not looking back, but we are pressing forward because we want to get to there. We want to become a promised land people. And promised land people are very different from slave people. You know, Israel emerged from Egypt as a slave people. And basically they were unsuited for the promised land. And yet Yahweh had experiences for them where his intention was to grow them into becoming a promised land people. Part of that is learning to renew our mind, and that's what we're going to be doing uh, today as we consider the Word of God. Romans chapter 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm, I'm really trusting and believing that today there's going to be some mind renewal going on in all of us. Uh, no matter what we think we know and no matter what we do know, <clears throat> there's always more that we can learn. You know, the good message, the good news message of the Bible is captured in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Yeshua, he is a brand new creation the old is gone, and the new has come. And we want to look at that new creation. I don't know about you, but I, I remember decidedly when I was 16 and gave my life to the Lord, there was a change. I was a church-going boy. Uh, you know, I was part of youth group. My family went to church every week. But when I gave my life to the Lord, there was an immediate change in my awareness of the Word of God. Uh, the Word became alive at a level that it hadn't been before. But by and large, there was so much of the old life still being part of me that I really didn't wrap my head around the idea that if any man, any woman is in Yeshua, you are a brand new creation. One of the translations says you're living in a new world. And my question is, is it really a new world? <clears throat> is it simply the old world with uh, an added spiritual dimension, uh, maybe you're a little more religious, or in fact, have you discovered that to be a follower of Yeshua, to be a Talmudin, to be one of his disciples, is to enter into a completely uh, new world. <clears throat> Everyone uh, in the family of Yahweh is adopted. None of us are naturally born into the family. We, an invitation is given to us, and we choose to respond to that invitation. But once you've responded to that invitation appropriately, you become a son or daughter of the Most High God. And the Bible literally says that the old man, the old spirit you, has passed away. And something brand new is now birthed into you. Uh, you are chosen. And now you're part of a family that has a new heritage, you have a new name, you have a new dwelling place, and in fact, everything 
uh, becomes new. That's what the Bible says. And so last week we were uh, pointing out the fact there were two questions we wanted to address. Question number one, and these are questions that will alter your self-image and your identity. If you don't change your self-image, if you don't change your awareness of who you are in Yeshua, then you think of yourself as the same uh, person you always were. Uh, I'm the boy that grew up. I'm the young man in college. I'm, I'm all these things out of my past, but that's not true. Because the Bible says that if you are in Christ, if you are in Yeshua, that all things have become new. And so the question then is, who are you? And we addressed that last week, uh, specifically around the fact that uh, you have a name that is known personally by your heavenly father. Yeshua in the parable said that the shepherd comes in and he calls sheep, each one by their name. That it is a personal relationship. This is not a theology. This is not a, I believe in God, the creator. Uh, the story of faith in Yeshua, of being a follower of Yeshua, it's a family story. And Yahweh, our Father, as Yeshua taught us, He is our Father, uh, knows each of us by name. He knows every facet of our life. But the second question is one I want to address today. And that is the question, so where are you from? Where are you from? And, and, and last week we kind of hinted at it and said that context is vital to everything in the new creation reality. I use the example of of a little boy who met a new neighbor boy, and, and after playing with him for a while, he comes back and he says to his mom, Mommy, he says, where, where did I come from? And she thought it was kind of early, but she gives him the facts of life and all that, and his eyes get wide, and he says, Oh, I just wondered, because Tommy next door said he's from Chicago. And the, the mom didn't have the context to answer the question. And so the question is, uh, where are you from? And it needs some context. Let me give you another a humorous example of that, by the way. If, if I were to say you and I are in an airplane, and I open the door of the airplane, and I say to you, I'll give you $250,000 if you'll jump out of the airplane without a parachute. Well, the, most people are going to say, no way. I don't care how much the money is. But what if I said, oh, by the way, the airplane is sitting on the runway over a five-foot bank of soft snow? Well, instantly it changed. Instantly my image changes, and instantly $250,000 to jump out of this door into that snowbank, of course I'm going to do that. You see, I had the wrong context. When you said we're in an airplane and I opened the door, I've got the airplane 20,000 feet in the air, and there's no way I'm going to jump out of it. But you change the context, and suddenly uh, possibilities open up for me. And I submit to you that the context of the Christian life has been uh, wrongly put in front of us, uh, that everything that is of benefit in the Christian life has put, been put off to heaven. When we get to heaven, we'll be well. When we get to heaven, we'll, all our needs will be met. When we get to heaven, life is going to be great. When we get to heaven, we'll be on top and not underneath. When we get to heaven, you know, we're going to be free from the things that, that come to oppress us. And, and so for, for most people, the Christian faith is all about heaven. And in fact, moving from here to there, uh, the there they're looking forward to is someday I'm going to die, this is all going to be over and I'll be in heaven. You know, what a wrong concept when Yeshua said the kingdom of God is here and now. It's an exciting kingdom and you and I are meant to live in that kingdom here and now. So the question again is, where are you from? <clears throat> in Colossians chapter 2 verse 20, in the Amplified Bible it reads this way, if then you have died with Yeshua to material ways of looking at things and have escaped from the world's crude and elementary notions and teachings, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? <clears throat> if in fact any man in, in Yeshua is a, a brand new person and that we're, we're no longer bound by this world, Paul's question is, if that's true, why are you living as if you still belong to the world? Why are you living from the old place? 
you know, when <clears throat> somebody moves from one country legally to another country, you, you come into America legally because you want to become an American, you're going to adopt an American way of life, you're going to speak English, it's going to be your new culture. You know, otherwise you're kidding yourself. If you're not willing to do that, uh, then basically you're trying to rip off the good things of another culture, but I don't want the, the culture. Just as an aside, many, many people want the benefits of the benefits of being a Christian, but they don't actually want to be a Christian. I want to go to heaven when I die, but I don't want to change my life now. See, that, that doesn't work, and Yeshua is very clear about that. In the men, end times, he said many will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name, and he'll say, I never knew you. In other words, you said the prayer, you went to church, you maybe even became a leader in the church, but you were all about, I want the benefits of being a Christian, but I don't want the life and discipline of being a Christian. And so <clears throat> the immigrant that comes in who is sincere, their, their goal is I want to learn to speak English, I want to know the American way of life, I want to know the culture, I want to work, I want to become a participant in this great free enterprise experiment that's going on. And I no longer want to live like I'm in the old country. See, if you want to live the way of the old country, then why did you leave the old country? And, and many people get discouraged and, 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 and quit, so to speak, the, the Christian faith. They were once on fire, and, and now they're not. And why? For, for many of those people, and as a pastor for years, you know, I remember the largest baptism service I had. We baptized over 150 people. In, in one baptism service. You know, getting people to, to want the blessings of the kingdom was easy, but getting them to understand you're now going to adopt a new way of life. You, why are you living uh, as if you still belong to the world when you claim that Yeshua has set you free? And, and that leads to a frustrating Christianity. It leads to a Christianity that doesn't work, and it's not working for some, Far too many people. Why? Because we're still living as if we belong to the world, as if that's where we're from. So again, the question is, well, then where are you from? Where are you from once you become born again? If, if I do not live in the world, then where am I to live? And Ephesians chapter 2 has an amazing statement that, again, if you look at it, well, it's theology and it means thus and so. You're going to miss the impact of it. Paul writes this, God raised us up with Yeshua and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Yeshua the Messiah. Now, th think about that. What, what Paul is writing is that, that we already are seated with him in the heavenly places. It, it's not when I die and go to heaven then I have a seat with Yeshua. That's not what the Bible teaches. We've got to realize there's another dimension that you and I can make a reality, because it is real. We can make a reality in this present life, and it will change entirely your awareness of where you're from and therefore who you are. God raised us up with Yeshua and seated, past tense. It's already been done. <clears throat> Yahweh is not <clears throat> waiting to look at our lives to watch how we live them out. And then at the end of our life, he's going to say, okay, let me read, well, good, bad, good, bad, throw out the bad, keep the good. And it, it, the decision has already been made because in the dimension we're going to talk about today, we're not dealing with past, present, and future. We're dealing with now. And all the promises of Yahweh are yes and amen. Uh, they are present realities, but the devil has co-opted the mindset of the church to take present realities and shift them into the future, and that's not where they belong. So the question is, well, where am I to live? I'm to be living from my position of authority in the heavenlies. I am not from the earth. I am now... Uh, from the heavenlies. This world is not my home. This world is my assignment. It is my duty station, but it's not my home. Now, let me share a, a, a quick little story about that. Those of you who've been to 
to Israel with us on one of our trips can appreciate that. And, and if you haven't been, I certainly invite you to come on our, our next trip to Israel. But, but I remember a, a great transformation happened to me personally the first time I went to Israel. Uh, my wife Donna had gone before me, and she had been to Israel, and, and I, I had, to be honest, I had no desire to go there. I did not want to go on a tourist thing of, uh, of Roman Catholic holy sites. I mean, that's the way I looked at it. But when, when I came to the point where I knew I had to go to Israel, an amazing thing happened. And, and to, to put it in, in a short term, when, when I got off the plane, got on the bus, and we were driving to our, our first hotel, uh, at that time of the year and where we were driving, uh, Israel was pretty brown and barren. And it certainly didn't have, you know, the, the oceans of, uh, of New England or the forest of the, of the Cascades. Um, it, it, it was barren. There was nothing in the in the natural that said beauty, uh, you know, welcome home, this is your place. But as we're on that bus and we're driving to our first, I'm looking out the window, and the only way I can describe it is the land began to speak to me. There was a voice speaking inside of me, this is your home. And when we came to the last night of that trip, uh, I was standing in the window of our hotel overlooking the great synagogue with my daughter Jordan. And, uh, you know, tears are running down her little cheeks. And she says, you know, Daddy, uh, I don't want to leave. I feel like this is home. And I knew exactly what she meant. And ever since that first trip, and that was, I don't know, 12, 14, 16 years ago. Ever since that first trip, I have always felt when I'm living here in America I'm on an assignment in America, but Israel's my home. You know, wherever I went, growing up in the military, uh, traveling around the world with my dad and mom uh, in the military, uh, I always knew I was an American. That was my identity, and I, I carried America with me wherever I went. And so I could be living in a foreign land, but I'm an, I'm an American. Where am I from? I'm from America. And, and what happened... And that first trip and simply has been solid ever since. It's never changed in me. Is that I located my home uh, in this dimension. I located my home and my home is Israel. Uh, that's my home. I'm on an assignment here. Now, in that same way, uh, the Bible is trying to give us a picture that will break us free from the, the con confinement of this world is my home. And if we can't break three, free from that, then we're trying to live an otherworldly life, but we're worldly bound. We're trying to live, one of the translations says, uh, you know, calls us, we were aliens and strangers. That's who we become. We're aliens. Well, you know, to a certain extent, if you feel comfortable with the world, then the power of God, the presence of God, the, the manifestation of the joy of God it's going to be very challenging to become part of your life because you're living in the world. And another way of saying that, well, I may be in the world, but I'm not of the world. Well, where are you from? And that leads me to, to ask a question today. And the question is this. Is there another dimension? We could even say dimensions. Is there another dimension beyond that which we have experienced? And, and, you know, I, I, I'd love to get off on that from a quantum physics realm. Uh, there are certainly many dimensions. I'll, I'll talk about that later. But let me give you an example of that from the scriptures in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6. This is where <clears throat> Elijah has stirred up uh, the um, king who is wondering who's giving away the secrets and everything. I think you know the story. The king sends his armies to Dothan, uh, which is actually north of Nablus, of Shechem, excuse me, of Shechem. And we go to Shechem when we're, we're in that area there. We've never yet taken the trip north of that up to Dothan. Um, but uh, there, uh, there in, in Dothan, the armies of the king surround uh, Elisha and his servant. And the servant... Uh, looks out in the morning and it says here, 
when the servant of the man, verse uh, 15, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. So he's living in this dimension called earth. It's a dimension of uh, three dimensions of, of, of measurement plus we can add time to it and you've got a fourth dimension. He's living in the world you and I live in every day. And he gets up and he goes to the wall of the city and he looks out and the city is entirely surrounded by the king's horses and chariots. And oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Uh, you know, instant panic, instant uh, understanding that, wait a minute, you know, this is it, the, the, the jig is up, you know, the king has come to get us, because if he's going to get the prophet, you know he's going to get the servant of the prophet as well. And in verse 17, Elijah prays an interesting prayer. He says, Yahweh, open his eyes so he can see. Now, wait a minute. The servant obviously could see. He saw all the, the king's armies, all the king's horses and all the king's men. <laughs> he sees them. He, he's not blind. And yet Elisha says, open his eyes so he can see. There was something there that the servant could not see and required a supernatural intervention. Elijah could have preached a sermon on the power of God. He could have preached him a sermon on, you know, God is with us and will never fail us. He could have uh, quoted scriptures about, uh, you know, Yahweh's un unfailing presence and his power. Uh, in he could have quoted verses. But the challenge was that the servant could only see in the natural. And the verses of God himself don't mean anything <clears throat> if all you can see is the natural. You can quote a verse of God, but if all you see is the natural, your mind takes over and says, yeah, but. I understand that's what the Bible says, but. <clears throat> the word but is evidence that you are locked into the, this dimension of human experience. You're locked into it. And the verse of the Bible makes no sense. My God meets all your needs according to his riches in glory. But I'm looking at a bill. But I, you know, but they're going to repossess my house. But I, I've, I've got to have this money. And, well, oh, my God meets your need. And the following but comes, well, how's God going to do that? And, and again, we're, we're locked into this natural realm. So Yahweh is trying to speak. Holy Spirit is trying to awaken us to a truth that is from another dimension. But we're trying to grab hold of it in this dimension. And so we're only going to see what is in this dimension. Oh, oh this is good. I hope you get this today. We're trying to grab spiritual truths which are from another dimension, but we're locked into this dimensional way of thinking. And so the prophet says, Lord, Yahweh, open his eyes so he can see. And it says, Yahweh opened the servant's eyes and he saw that the hill was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So suddenly, looking with the natural, he sees the king's horses. But when his eyes are open to another dimension, he sees instantly the horses, the chariots of fire of Yahweh are around Elisha. Now here's my question. Were the horses and chariots of fire real? Were they real? Was it, oh, you know, by faith I believe. Uh, by, by faith I see, but your mind is saying, I don't see at all. I don't even know what you're talking about. Or did the servant literally see, come on, did he see 
chariots of fire uh, uh, of Yahweh. The Bible says he saw into another dimension. And, and we're going to talk about that dimension, but we need to understand that dimension is real. Until we come to understand that dimension is real, then we end up playing mind games with ourselves, and we're living bound by one dimension, trying to make ourselves believe in another dimension. If you knew for certainty that those chariots of fire of God were there, would that change your perspective of what's going on? You see, the chariots of the king are there. This is not Christian science that tries to pretend things aren't that really are. Faith, faith does not deny the reality of this dimension. Faith looks into another dimension, which is a higher reality. Faith doesn't say that sickness is not there. Faith does not throw the bill in the trash and say, I don't see a bill. There's no bill. That's not faith. Faith is not calling things that are as though they're not. Faith is calling things that are not yet revealed as though they are. And that is a huge difference. And uh, my experience as a pastor is that the vast majority of Word of faith believing Christians are really operating in a realm of here in trying to deny the reality. Abraham, it says in, in Romans 4, Abraham looked at his body and, and in essence, paraphrase, it's very clear. He says, yep, this body is as good as dead, but I'm going to produce an heir. See, he didn't deny that the body was was uh, old. He didn't deny that Sarah was barren. He just had a higher truth. I have the word of God and the word of God says we're going to have a child. And faith could look straight at that barren womb and straight at that, that dead body and say, I see that, but I see a higher reality. Elisha knew that those chariots of fire were there. But he knew also that the servant needed to see it, literally see it, because he couldn't believe it. We're talking about dealing with the unseen world. Is there another dimension? Uh, I, I remember reading years ago about uh, the doctor, I believe was in Vienna, who uh, that tried to deal with uh, a disease that was passed on in the, in the birthing hospital, that the, Babies were dying, moms were dying, what's going on? And he believed that the doctors moving from one patient to the next were carrying the disease from one to the other. This was before germs were established as real. So he insisted that everybody on his staff wash their hands. When you finish this, wash your hands before you go to another patient. Well, that seems so natural to us today. But it was so radical and he was talking about things people could not see that they actually hounded him out of the medical profession and the doctors in, in the towns and cities would not accept him uh, as a doctor because he believes in these things called germs that you can't see. We now know he was absolutely right. Is there a world that you cannot see with the natural eyes that impacts the world you can see. And so with that in mind, we can look at, at Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 7, writes, we walk, that word walk there means we live or conduct ourselves. We walk by faith, not by sight. In fact, faith sees that which is not yet revealed uh, to the senses. Are there other dimensions? When you get in the world of quantum physics, you're going to find out, oh yeah, they have no question there are other dimensions. And how many? And this is all resolved through math. Why is it by math? Because we don't live in that dimensional world. A flatlander, I, oh, I'd love to get off and teach this, but 
you know, a flatlander, a two-dimensional person, a two-dimensional entity, if there were such a thing, could never understand three dimensions. Every time you describe a third dimension, it simply can take two dimensions and lay another two-dimensional layer on it. That's not what three dimensions is about. So, uh, and, and, and Google that, look up Flatlander sometime and, and just look at how the world would look to a Flatlander. Everything that you and I know, because we're three-dimensional creatures, what we see has depth to it, length, height, and depth. Um, the, the Flatlander would, would not see anything the way we see, because he's only seeing in, in one dimension. And when you try to explain the third dimension, it, it, it cannot be explained in a way he can grasp it. You would have to be able to take him out of the two dimensions and literally move him into three dimensions. Well, the same way uh, with these other dimensional realities, other dimensional worlds. Mathematically, quantum physics uh, physicists know it exists. They know there's other worlds. Uh, that they, they seem to be talking about 10 different dimensions. Well, what are they? We don't know. We, we just know mathematically they're there. We have some other indications that they might be there because there are things in quantum physics that just disrupt our three-dimensional knowledge. A particle can be in two places at the same time. And, and traditional physicists, man, this just causes their mind to go tilt because, you know, we all know you can't be in two places at once. Well, if a particle can be in two places at once, then logically anything can be in two places at once. And uh, what does that have to say with our experience of life? What it says is our experience of life is limited to these three dimensions but there's a whole other realm, and we're going to talk about that. Living in a, another dimension, one normally does no, normally will do things incomprehensible to those one dimension below. If I'm living in a fifth dimension, things are going to be ordinary and obvious to me and part of my life, which if they got manifested in Don Long's three-dimensional world would seem miraculous. Now, now, now hold that thought for a minute. You see, anything we don't understand, we tend to shove off into the world of the miraculous. And, and so, even in the church, we take all the miracles of Yeshua, and we call them miracles, but we're going to find out in a few moments, Yeshua didn't call them miracles. And, and Yeshua didn't say, well, I'm doing them from on God. He was doing them because he understood how a dimension called faith works. And it's not radical, and it's, it's ordinary, and of course it works in the dimension of faith. But if you're not in the dimension of faith, then these things seem random, circumstantial, rare, and miracles. Could it be? That Yeshua of Nazareth walked in a, uh, he walked in our world, but he walked with an awareness of, a connection to, and the power from knowing that there is another dimension called faith in which all things are possible. Could it be that, that Yeshua wasn't, wasn't operating as God in the world, and, and in the Bible is very clear. He put aside all his rights and prerogatives as God. He laid those aside. And he lived his human life on the planet here with what is available to any human being. And so he was operating, he was connected to, he was aware of it, uh, he was operating in a power that is normal in the dimension called faith in which all things are possible. Now, do we have Bible for that? We certainly do. Uh, Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, at the Tower of Babel, Yahweh says, we're going to come down and we're going to confuse the languages of the people so they'll do what they're supposed to do and scatter throughout the world. He said, because if we don't do that and they build this tower, 
then they're going to find out that nothing they plan to do will be impossible. Now, that's Bible. That's what, that's what Yahweh the Creator says about the human potential. That the human being can tap into a dimension, and when they tap into it, they will discover that nothing they would plan to do will be impossible. Well, then again, we get to Mark chapter 9, verse 23, and Yeshua says, everything is possible to him who believes. Now, obviously, we're talking about something well beyond our intellectual capabilities. This is beyond intellectual um, uh, doctrines and theology. There's a realm of faith that doesn't come out of this realm. It's stepping into a supernatural dimension called faith, and in that dimension, all things are possible. So the question is, can we start living beyond our limitations? You know, I like that verse in <clears throat> where Paul talks about the Christians who were giving, and he said they gave uh, in their poverty, they gave beyond their ability. How do you give beyond your ability? In other words, logically, they should have only been able to give so much money to the needs of the saints, but lo and behold, we found out they gave beyond that. Wow. They were living in a dimension that exceeds uh, what you can see, touch, handle, and smell. And Humanity, even the most brilliant people in humanity, have always been bound by the dimensions we understand. In 1842, a prominent scientist made this statement. Science will never be able to analyze the composition of the stars. What are they made of? And he was a brilliant scientist. He believed this, that science will never be able to to uh, analyze the composition of the stars. Well, it's done all the day, all the time now. Lord Kelvin, who is again a prominent scientist in the late 1800s, in 1895 he made this statement, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. This is not some, you know, quack. This is not some, you know, unscientific person. Lord Kelvin was very famous for uh, inventions and, and, and his ability to think things through. But this statement, heavier than air flying machines are impossible, it was only eight years later that he was proven wrong. This is not a quack. This is not an uneducated person. But it is a person who is bound by what he can see, touch, and feel and was unable in certain areas to think beyond that. You know, for, for years and years and years, the idea that you can take a, an object from Earth and propel it fast enough with enough force that it can escape gravity and move out into space uh, was regarded as preposterous. Scientists regarded that. Uh, here's an, another amazing one. On 29th December of 1934, Albert Einstein was quoted in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette as saying this, quote, there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. Albert Einstein, my goodness, it will ne there, there's no indication at all that it's obtainable. We can go on through science, we can go on through medicine, you know, you... Uh, you uh, people brought up today with limits. So you have the medical profession bound by, well, drugs can do this, can't do this, there's nothing that can be done, nothing that can be done, ruling out any other dimension that can impact health. That's why they're trained within the limitations. Well, so it is uh, in the church, that we come into the church with the word of God, which is to bring us to a higher level, to to make us aware that we are not to be limited by these dimensions, and yet we are earthbound, dimension-limited people, and so that clouds the Word of God, and we, we either say we don't believe that of the Word of God, or that happened as a special thing for the apostles or whatever, but we, we get it out of our life because it cannot be normal because guess what? Normal people don't experience. Glory to God. 
In fact, the one I, I, I like to use all the time, the four minute mile was seen as a barrier that nobody can break the four minute mile. And yet Roger Bannister did. And when he ran a mile in less than four minutes, suddenly things happened in people's brain. And what everybody accepted as a limit no longer was a limit, and increasingly people began to break the four minute mile. And I think the youngest person to do it now is a junior high student. And that's just amazing. That's just amazing. But whatever the mind of man can conceive, he can achieve. Well, if you can't conceive you can break it, then you're not going to break it. Glory to God. It was not a limit that was real. It was real only because it was perceived that way. And so I, I want to I begin to move this to a place by talking about a dimension called faith. Now, I know this is not the, the quantum mechanics, uh, you know, fifth dimension, sixth, seventh, but it is a dimension. And it is a dimension we have the experience of Yeshua walking it out, and we have experiences in our own lives that it's there. Uh, every one of us have experiences, I'm sure, that we have no natural explanation. Something told me to go this way instead of that. Something told me to do this. Well, what was the something? Is there, is there another dimension operating that if we only knew how to walk in it, our lives would be entirely different? Yeshua demonstrated things that were or are, or are thought to be impossible. But he demonstrated them. Did he do these things because he was God? Or because he understood how the dimension of faith works? In the reality that he called the kingdom of God, which he kept trying to get us to understand, is here and now. So the dimension of Faith could be called the dimension of the kingdom of God. Now, let me tell you uh, a, a few incidences where I think it's very clear that he was not claiming this was his. This is a dimension that works for anybody because it's, it's real. In Matthew chapter 14, verse uh, 28 to 32, this is where there's a, a storm raging on the Sea of Galilee and Yeshua comes walking on the water. Now, if that's all there is, pe people religiously don't have a challenge with Yeshua walking on the water. They just jump over into this realm and say, well, he's God, of course he can walk on the water. Okay? But here's what Peter, Peter, you know, uh, looks out, they all think it's a ghost coming, and, and Yeshua says, it's me. And Peter says this in verse 28, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, now stop and think what he's saying. If that's really you, tell me to come to you. Now, Yeshua says come, but what else was he going to say? It is really him. That would have been a great opportunity for Yeshua to say, Peter, are you nuts? <laughs> Peter, are you crazy? I, I am the son of the living God, and I'm walking on water because I'm God, Emmanuel, uh, God with us. I'm, I'm deity incarnate. And, you know... <laughs> You, you want me to tell you to come walk on the water? What are you thinking, man? You're crazy. But he didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. He said, come. And the next part of the story is simply, you know, if we weren't so used to reading the Bible, we would be either having to say, I don't believe it, it's false, or to say, wow, there's something we, incomprehensible here. It says, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Yeshua. Now that, just by the context of it, it's not he took one step and then began to sink. It says he walked on the water. I don't know what qualifies for walking. In my mind, that's at least several, if not many steps. But the fact that he came toward Yeshua uh, is... Yeshua's out there and he steps out and he looks at Yeshua and he starts walking. He walked on the water and he came toward Yeshua. He walked on the water. What does the Bible say? He walked on the water. Now, you got a choice to make. 
One choice is I don't believe that because I don't believe in miracles. I don't believe in things like that. That we know from our world that cannot happen. Great, so throw it out. But by the way, then you're going to start throwing out anything uh, miraculous in the Bible and pretty soon you throw out the healings and you throw out the blessings and next thing you're going to throw out going to heaven altogether. I choose to believe the Bible is a word of God. I choose to believe that that Holy Spirit put us put this in here so we would know what happened. Glory to God. It says he walked on the water. A man. If, if we have any question about who Yeshua was, that's one thing. We have no question who Peter is. He, he, he's a man. Uh, he's not 100% right with Yeshua at this point because later he's going to deny knowing him. He's a man who still has fears. He's a fisherman. He, he's been out on the water. He's never seen any of his fellow fishermen walk on water. He has no experience of this. But as a man, something happened. There was a breakthrough in his dimensional thinking. All the others in the boat were so bound by the storm, bound by their fears, that they were bound into this dimension of thinking. Peter looks out, and in this dimension, the only way to explain what they're looking at is it's a ghost. But the ghost says, I'm Yeshua. And he says, if you're Yeshua, tell me to come out. Yeshua says, come. Wow. Suddenly, Peter had a glimpse into the dimension of faith. And with his eyes on Yeshua, he steps out of the boat. I, 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 I can't even begin to imagine what's going through the eyes of all the other disciples. You know, this is crazy. He's stepping out of the boat onto the water. And, and imagine their, their just, you know, amazement is, is too, too tame a word. He's actually walking. They're watching him. They're watching him. He's walking toward Yeshua on top of the water. How is he doing that? Because he's not living in the dimension they're living in. He's one of them. He lives in the same world. But at this moment, he stepped out of a common dimensional life that we all know, he stepped out of that into a, another dimension called faith. He saw, just like the servant saw the chariots of fire, saw them, Peter saw himself walking on the water. And in that dimensional dimension called faith, he was able to do what looked like a miracle in our dimension, but which was normal in the dimension called faith. Wow. And what happened, it says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. The dimension of faith requires that we learn to walk with our eyes on the word of God on Yeshua, on Yahweh, on our confidence in him, our eyes are on the Lord in the dimension of faith. The minute, the minute, the moment you take your eyes off the object of faith and look back into this three-dimensional world, you immediately sink back into the three-dimensional world. Come on, that's the battle. That's what we got to understand. Our goal is to learn how to live more and more and more in the dimension called faith. That, that's the goal. We want, to, we want to live in the dimension called faith. But the, the, the challenge is that the world of the dimensions in which we live in this planet screams at us, yells at us, demands our attention. <clears throat> Peter took his eyes off the Lord, looked at the wind. You know, he, it says he saw the wind. The wind and the waves. So does that mean that if there was no wind and waves, you can walk on water, but if it's windy, you can't? I mean, see, the, <clears throat> none of this is logical. If, it, if it's smooth water, can you walk? No. 
But so Peter walked on the water. Here's what Yeshua said. You of little faith. He began to sink. You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. <clears throat> now wait a minute. Peter gets out of the boat. He walks on the water toward Yeshua. He begins to sink. Lord, save me. Immediately, Yeshua reached out his hand and caught him. There's Peter. Lord, Lord, save me. <clears throat> and there's Yeshua puts his hand down and catches him. He's starting to sink. He catches him. And, and just like uh, Peter and uh, uh, John at the temple raised that uh, man up off his crippled mat, <clears throat> Yeshua just pulls him up. And it says, when they climbed into the boat, from where they were, they had to walk back to the boat. There's no indication at all that Yeshua carried him to the boat. They, they climbed into the boat. The picture is very clear. He walks out to Yeshua. He gets in doubt and fear and begins to sink. Yeshua grabs his hand, his faith is restored, and Yeshua and Peter together walk back to the boat. Peter's again walking on the water and climbs into the boat as surely as if it were on dry land. He climbed from the dry land into the boat. He's standing on the water and climbs into the boat. <clears throat> Yeshua's analysis of that is you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now there's two things we can learn there. He doesn't he doesn't say you need a lot of faith to walk on water. He had little faith. He had little faith. But little faith got him out into the water. Come on. The question wasn't you need more faith it's why did you doubt? That's a whole other lesson that uh, in a future week we're going to get to, I hope, <laughs> which is that it's not often that we need to have more faith. We've got to get rid of the doubt. Faith comes by hearing. And so someone says, well, I hear, 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 hear. And you're hearing the word, hearing the word, hearing the word. Well, faith is coming. Faith is being built up. It is. The Bible says it is. But you can have doubt in the midst of the faith. There's a man who said to Yeshua, I believe, help my unbelief. And we want to say, well, you, you either have faith or, or, or you don't. No. Right here's another thing. You had little faith, got you out of Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Why did you allow doubt to steal the result of the faith? Yeshua never said to Peter, you can't walk on water. By my mind. Now, in John chapter 14, verse 12, let's grab another one. Yeshua says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. So Yeshua is describing a dimension of, called faith, called the kingdom of God. And in that dimension, there are truths that override what we think are limits and truths in this dimension. You're sick, you gotta die. But in this dimension over here, you say the word and death leaves. In this dimension, you're broke, you're gonna lose your house, you're gonna lose your job, you're gonna lose all the stuff. Over in this dimension, my God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So, so this dimension called faith always supersedes this earth dimension if you'll do what, what if we'll learn to walk in this dimension. Walk conscious of it. Now, that brings me to the question, where are you from? Where are you from? If any man is in Christ, he's what? A new creation. A new creation. A new creature. 
as I said, one of the translates said, from another world. Wait a minute. Before, before you were born again, you were of your father, the devil. That, 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 Yeshua is very clear about that. Either God's your father the, or the devil's your father. And if you're not born again, then the devil's your father. Therefore, you're living in the confines of an earth-bound existence. There's another existence in Yeshua. That when we get born again, that new spirit is not from this world. Your born-again spirit is from a dimension called the kingdom of God, a dimension called faith. The spirit man birthed when you came into this planet uh, through the conception of a mother and father. That spirit is bound by the dimensions of this world. But the born-again spirit, I, I like one of the paraphrases, says, a brand new creation, something that never existed before. When you surrender your life to Yeshua, to follow Yahweh's plan for your life, the Bible describes Yahweh breathing into you a brand new spirit as certainly as he took that lifeless flesh of a body he created called Adam and breathed his spirit into Adam. So when someone gets born again, that lifeless entity now has the breath of Yahweh breathed in, and that new creation reality is you are now from the dimension called faith. That's your home. Just like within this Dimensional world, I shared that, that I am from Israel. That's where my heart is. That's what floods through me. When I fly there, I'm home. When I leave there, I'm sad. When I'm here, with all the blessings I have while I'm here, in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, in, my, in a nice house, and, but, the, but my heart wants to be in Israel. My heart wants to be home. So it is that where you are from is a dimension called faith, called the kingdom of God. That's why when you live in this world and become part of this world, then you reject your home, there, there's a disquiet in your spirit. That's why a, a one who's truly born again cannot sin and enjoy it. Because it's against your nature. Now, let me, let me take a few minutes in closing here because I want to, I want to shift this to, to a, another thought. You got, I want you to wrap your head around that. I'm not from this world. We'll, we'll get to, back to that. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, now watch this, 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are therefore Yeshua's ambassadors. In the family of Yahweh, all the children are ambassadors. You know, I, I like the fact that our, our current president has his, his family members out there, you know, with different assignments to carry out his, their ambassadors for him. In the family of God, you're an ambassador for Yeshua. That's your job. Well, I wish I had a calling. You do have a calling. You're an ambassador for Yeshua. We are therefore Yeshua's ambassadors. That's your job. You might work at a certain company, but your, your calling is an ambassador. I'm in that company. They may be paying me wages, but I'm an ambassador for Yeshua. Now, what is an ambassador? An ambassador is a person who represents one country to another. I, I think some of you are ready to get this. An ambassador is somebody who represents one dimension to another dimension. Ambassador is, is from somewhere, representing that somewhere in another place. If I think I'm of this world, I'm just human, that's all I am, then what am I representing when I speak of Yeshua, 
what I'm representing is religion. If, if I am from this world, bound by this world, well, I'm just human. We all have to do this. I'm living like the world. Believe that's well, that's all until we go to heaven. We're, we're, just, or I'm, we're just human beings. Then I'm just a human being trying to relate to other human beings. And what I'm relating to them is religion. But if in fact I am inherently from another dimension called faith, Living in a three-dimensional bound world where faith isn't even understood, then I am representing this dimension, speaking into this other dimension what I know is true from here. Hmm. Listen, I'm from one place, but I'm living in another. Where I live is not where I am from. I'm living here, but I'm not from here. Now, if I'm from a wealthy nation and I'm sent as an ambassador to a poor nation, I do not live according to the standards of where my dwelling place is, but according to the standards of where I'm from. Uh, let, me, let me give you a good example. I've been to Haiti several times, and, and Haiti, if you've never been there, it's hard to imagine. Haiti is, is squalor, you know, just unimaginable. And you can drive through Port-au-Prince, and you get the smells and the sights and the garbage and the streets and everything, and you come by this, this compound with this big wall around a big white building, and it's the American Embassy. The American ambassador living in the American embassy is not living according to Haitian standards. Uh, there may or may not be electricity in Port-au-Prince. They may have rolling blackouts and all that. But within the embassy, the ambassador always has electricity. He's not living according to the standards of Haiti. He's living according to the standards of America and therefore he has a generator to make sure he's got electricity. He's not living according to the quality of the food or lack thereof in Haiti. He's living on food that is flown in from America. I don't know, daily, weekly, whatever it is. Food is flown in, taken to the, to the embassy, stored in their freezers and everything. So he's eating, you know, at the... Uh, the lifestyle of the kingdom called America while he's an ambassador to the kingdom called Haiti. Please get hold of this. If, if, if he's living according to the standards of Haiti, what does that tell the Haitians about America? Why would they ever want the blessings of America? Why would they ever... I want democracy. Why would they ever want anything if, in fact, the American ambassador is struggling just like they are? Why would the world want anything to do with the kingdom of God if the ones representing the kingdom of God are living just like the rest of the world? Same standards, same morality, <clears throat> same failure, same sicknesses, same diseases, same poverty. If, if there's nothing in the ambassador's life, the ambassador for Yeshua, in this world to demonstrate, I want to know about the world you're from, then what is the point of being an ambassador? Glory to God. If anyone is born again, he's a new creation altogether. Or as we read at the beginning of this, this message this morning, Colossians 2.20, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Christian, why are we living as if we belong to this world when we can live from a dimension called faith and the world will want to know about that dimension? We need to begin to see ourselves seated with Yeshua in the heavenly realms 
in the dimension of the kingdom of God, the dimension of faith. And we need to realize that we're on an assignment here and we can begin to live by the standard, the power, the authority of our position there. I don't live out of here. I live out of who I am. Who are you? And I live uh, out of the position of where am I from? I am from the kingdom of God. Wow. There was a missionary, a woman missionary years ago that when she was doing, maybe still does it, but she would always say, I've been sent by the Most High God. You crusade, all these people out there, you know, pagans and everything, and she's, I've been sent by the Most High God. And she preaches about the Most High God. And then to demonstrate that he's the Most High God, uh, starts praying for healings, and they start taking place all over the place. That, that, that is meant to be, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm from another kingdom, and now the demonstration is there. Now, listen to this in closing. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. God's divine power has given us, has given us, it's already done. God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, his glory and goodness, he's given us very great and precious promises. So that through these, what? Through the precious promises, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world. This is an ambassador verse. This is living as an ambassador. God's already given us everything we need. He's given us promises. And through these promises, we can live participating in the divine nature in this world. What was Yeshua doing? He was participating in the divine nature in the world. I only do what I see my father do. I only say what my father says. I'm participating in the divine nature, and therefore another dimension has broken forth. It's a dimension where water can become wine. It's a dimension where loaves and fishes can multiply. It's a dimension where the dead can raise again. It's a dimension where you can walk on water. It's a dimension where you can stand up in the middle of a storm and speak to it, and the storm stops. It's a dimension where the power of God isn't doing miracles. It's operating at a law of the other dimension that always supersedes any limitations in this dimension. That's where you're from, Christian. That's where you're from. You're from another world. You're from another place. And so the answer is, where are you from? I'm not of this world. I'm from another dimension, the dimension where faith makes all things possible to me in this earth dimension. I am living here in this world representing a much higher dimension, a higher authority, a much higher realm of life. According to Philippians 4.13, I have strength for all things in Yeshua who empowers me. I'm ready for anything. I'm equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I'm self-sufficient in his efficiency. And so make a determination, determination today. And in closing, this is what it is. You determine. You decide. As I move from here to there, and you might want to say this after me, as I move from here to there, I am starting to live my life at a much higher level of faith than I ever thought possible. I am the head, not the tail. I am the victorious one not the defeated one. The word of Yahweh is working effectively in my life. I am becoming all my Father has intended me to be. I do not quit. I do not retreat. I do not fall back. I push forward for I walk by faith and not by sight. May the Lord bless these words to you. And by that, 
I mean, may they continue to revolve in as you meditate on them, leading you to the dimension called faith, and may a new dimension be part of your life this week. In the name of Yeshua. Amen.